Good morning and welcome to worship with us here on this Sunday morning, the last Sunday of April. And um, we are well into officially over a month of worshiping apart. And we miss all of you terribly and would love to have you sitting in these seats here. We hope that maybe in another month, um, maybe that will be possible in some way or form. But we're glad that you are here on Zoom with us this morning and worshiping with us as we celebrate that we indeed, no matter where we are, we are the church. Please join with us in our gathering songs. to make just a few announcements before we continue on with our worship service this morning. Um, we are beginning this Wednesday a new uh, ministry as part of our Zoom and home ministry to all of you, 
And we are beginning something which right now I'm calling our midweek connection. And uh, so we are going to have a, a gathering on Wednesday evenings from 6.30 to 7.30, um, in which we'll have a time um, to, to gather, to talk with one another, um, have a discussion about uh, a ministry topic, maybe the sermon from today. Um, so take notes. And um, then also have a, a chance to be in prayer together. I know part of that may be my own thing, is that on Sunday mornings now, I don't get to talk to all of you very much. Um, you all get to see and talk to each other, um, but I don't get that opportunity um, in the way we're doing things. Um, so that's a chance for me. But also, I think, you know, as we are home and isolated and have so little opportunities to gather and to be social and connect with one another, that I think this extra time on Wednesday evenings will be a, a great time to do that. So I hope that you will join us. Um, you can use the exact same process you got on to uh, worship this morning um, to get onto that meeting um, at 6.30 on Wednesdays, starting this week. And we're planning on having all of us here uh, in our own homes, uh, but being a part of that, sharing in music, um, a time of teaching and lessons, and a time of prayer. So I hope that you will join us for that. All right, let's now join together in our call to worship. Hear us, Lord, and answer us. For we are poor and needy. You are our God. Have mercy on us, Lord. For we call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord. For we put our trust in you. Please join with us in our hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus. You may not recognize this, so feel free to, uh, to listen as we go through this hymn today.
The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Then This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgetten, forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. There was a father who, uh, passing by the bedroom door to his son saw that his son was about to pray at his bedside and he listened and as the boy began his prayer he said Harold thank you for my family and for everything and Harold if you could could you please help me with school and the father was looked around very confused and and went in and said son why are you praying to Harold And the boy said, well, that's God's name. We say it every week in church. And the father was even more confused and said, what do you mean? He goes, our father, Harold, is his name. We say that prayer every week in school (laughs) and in church. And uh, today we sing um, at the beginning, um, uh, and he walks with me. I've I've also heard the joke that God's name is Andy um, because (laughs) Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. Anyway, um, we say this prayer every week in church, do we not? We say a version of it every week. Now, we say trespasses as part of the prayer, um, and uh, some people say debtors, and some people say sins and sinners. And I I always wondered myself what the difference was. And and part of the problem is that um, the, the language used in this particular scripture uses all three of those words. Um, 
the, uh, the actual translation, now these words are used other places in the gospel um, as well as throughout the Bible. And so that's the comparison they have, right? So they compare how a word is used here versus how it's used in other places. And um, so, you know, as it begins, you know, we, we talk about uh, forgive uh, us our debts. The actual word there most often is translated sins. So forgive us our sins. Um, however, um, they used a completely different word for the end of that sentence. So it's forgive us our sins as we also forgiven our debtors. So the word used there in the second half of that sentence um, is actually the word used for debtors most often in the Bible. So you can see now why, right? Some people pick the first word and talk about its sins and sinners. And some people use that second word in Greek uh, that means debtors and then becomes debts and debtors. And they talk about that. What was really fascinating to me and maybe also to you um, is why we say trespasses. Now, if you read on down in the scripture today, you will see that at the end of it in, in verse 14 and 15, the word they use is trespass. So as Jesus begins to explain this prayer to his disciples, he says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, and there they, he really used the word in Greek that means to, to, to impede upon, to go into somewhere you're not supposed to be, to trespass. So he used a completely third kind of word, trespass, there. Um, but I was wondering, you know, okay, so fine, that's where the word trespass comes from, but why is it that way in our, why do we pray that way? And it all goes back, it was very fascinating to me, to William Tyndale. Now you all know William Tyndale, I'm sure. Um, he lived from 1494 to 1536. And um, he was a, a great English reformer, in case you don't know who he was, um, who first translated the Bible into English. Um, and um, in fact, um, he did so um, at his own peril because the King of England had made it illegal to do that. And um, so he, trans he, he did that first translation in secret and then published it and then spent the last 10 years of his life in hiding, um, trying not to get caught, uh, but he was eventually caught. And, um, and in his translation, he used the word trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We have no idea why he did that. Um, but he did. He used the word trespass for the beginning part of the prayer and for the parts at the end of our scripture in 14 and 15. Um, why he preferred this translation um, when few before or after him did so is only speculation. He published this English New Testament in 1526, like I said, against the will and law of Henry VIII, um, and then lived in mortal fear from then on. Um, he never had a chance to go back and to reconsider that scripture because he was in hiding and then uh, was caught and killed for making this translation in the first place. When the, when the King James Version came out um, just a few years later in 1611, they used the word debt and debtors, like we say today. But somehow, um, in the midst of all that, they created a book of prayer and they used it based on Tyndale's um, interpretation of that scripture. And so because of this one person and his one version of the Bible that only existed really or was used for, um, you know, 50, 20 or 30 years, um, that one little moment in time is why we say trespasses instead of debt and debtors. Now, if you go to different churches, they say different words for that, and that's based on their particular history. But ours goes back to the Anglican Church, and the Church of England ended up using that prayer book that was copied from and used Tyndale's um, translation of this Bible. So you may not find any of that fascinating. That may have just been the most boring two minutes of your, of your life, but I thought it was very interesting um, and I've always wondered why we say trespass and trespasses in those scriptures. One of the things that this scripture teaches us is how to pray, right? That's what Jesus begins. He says, you know, because the, the disciples have asked him, how do we pray? And Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. And he gives them this prayer. 
And this prayer has become, like we said, through Tyndall's words and others, has become um, a, a regular tradition of our church to say. And we say it every single Sunday, this prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And one of the fascinating things about this prayer is, is what it teaches us that prayer should not be, right? In these opening scriptures, as Jesus is talking about prayer, he's very, very specific about what prayer should not be. He says, whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and, and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. And their reward that they're seeking was praise and adulation. They wanted to be praised and thought highly of because of their wonderful, verbose, filled with words, public for everybody to see prayers. They weren't doing it to glorify God, and they weren't doing it to, to increase their faith. They were doing it for show. So he said, do not pray like that. Do not pray to make a show. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. Now, today, ta-da, it's very easy for us to pray in secret, is it not? <laughs> because we are all separated into our own homes, um, and are spending many, many more hours, even, if, even those of us who are introverts are spending way more time alone and isolated than we normally would. And so we are having no trouble with that part of Jesus' instructions here in this scripture. But what else does scripture say? What else does scripture tell us about prayer? I was struck by the, the, the scripture, the words from Matthew 5, verses 40, verse 44. It says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Wow, that's a hard one, isn't it? We're supposed to pray in secret and we're supposed to pray for those who persecute us. And then in Luke um, 22, 42, the, a story we just read a few weeks ago. Jesus is praying to God and says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. And yet, not my will, but yours be done. So there, Jesus in action is praying that it is not our will to be done, but it is God's will to be done. We should be praying for God's will to be done, right? And isn't that kind of part of our part of our prayer, right? We say, our Father who art in heaven, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, not Harold, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We see we use those words from that time period. That, and that, and that, you know, some people might say that that is a old language, but it, to me, it connects us. It connects us to all of these Christians and others who have followed in these century upon century upon century of time. And it connects us all the way back to Jesus when he gave us these words to pray. But we pray in the middle of that prayer, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So we pray these same words that Jesus then in action, only a short time later, he himself, in the middle of prayer, is praying that same prayer. I was struck by uh, a book. I love Anne Lamott. If you don't haven't ever read any of Anne Lamott's books, I highly encourage you to, to pull some out, um, to buy some or get some somehow. Is the library still open? No? E-books. Uh, E-books work? Yeah. And um, so, but Anne Lamott is a, a wonderful writer. And one of her newer books is called Help, Thanks, Wow. Uh, it's the three essential prayers. <laughs> and um, the three essential prayers, think about that. Help, thanks, wow. And she says in her book, prayer is taking a chance that against all odds and past history, we are loved and chosen. 
and do not have to get it together before we show up. And she also continues on to say, gratitude begins in our heart and then dovetail into behavior. It almost always makes you willing to be of service, which is where joy resides. It means you are willing to stop being such a jerk. Now you see why I like her writing. When you are aware of all that has been given to you in your lifetime, and in the past few days even, it is hard not to be humbled and pleased to give back. And that goes back to those words, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When we see and, re and, and connect with God through humbleness and gratitude, our perspective of the world and of the troubles that face us change. We see not just the problems around us, but we begin to open up our eyes to see the possibilities around us. When we pray, as in our prayer chain, when we lift up all of our concerns um, and pray for those around us, our prayers truly do matter. Our prayers truly do go out into the world and bring hope and comfort to those around us. But I have to be honest with you, the number one person that your prayers change is you. We are the ones who are changed when we pray, whether that is for help, as Anne Lamott says, help for ourselves, help for others. When we give thanks for all that God has given to us, and when we take time to just praise God, to just step back and say, wow and realize all of the blessings that we have within us. That prayer, whether it's any one of those three, it changes us. Prayer transforms us, and it is why it is such an essential part of who we are as the church. Prayer changes the prayer. as much or more than the world around us. And so I want to encourage you in this time, you know, it's too often that we say, and I'm even guilty of it every once in a while, I'll say, if you can help in this whatever problem we're facing, if you can help financially, or if you can be here um, and be present, you know, maybe it's fixing a roof or whatever it is, um, if you can help in any of those ways, great. If you're unable to do any of that, then you can pray for us. Do you hear that? Do you hear the way that sounds? You know, if you're not really capable of helping us, then you can pray. And I think too often that is how we approach prayer. Prayer is that thing we do when we can't do anything else. And I want to encourage us today to not think of prayer that way. Prayer needs to be the first thing we do when we wake up in the morning and the last thing we do in the evening. There is a, a Native American um, ministry, uh, ministry, there's a Native American tribe and a, a person was, a sociologist was watching them and he, 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 he watched them in the morning. They would go to the river and they would, they would begin with prayer and they, and, they, and they would do that. And then in the evening, they would come back to the river and they would say a completely different prayer. And he went and was interacting with the tribe and, and talking to them about that. And he said, you, you do a, an interesting prayer in the morning and at night. What is? And they go, no, it's the same prayer. And he goes, no, it, it can't be the same prayer. You're using different words. 
Um, you know, you're, and it's different language. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. The morning is the beginning of the prayer. That prayer continues throughout the whole day wherever we find ourselves. And that same prayer ends that night. And that needs to be the life that we leave, lead. A life that is in prayer from morning till night. We need to look for those times where we can ask for help and we need to be willing to do so humbly to lay ourselves before God honestly. And God can take it. God can take it. And God would rather hear a prayer about how we are doubting God than a false prayer about how we are never and never doubt. God wants us to be honest with him. And prayer is our chance to do that. Morning, afternoon, night. And prayer doesn't have to be a lot of words. Prayer doesn't have to be the right words. How many times are, have we um, not wanted to pray perhaps in public or at a meal or at a meeting because we're afraid we won't say the right words or we'll, we won't sound intelligent or proficient at praying. The words don't matter. What matters is that we approach God honestly and humbly. If we can do those things, then our prayer will truly change the prayer. And we will truly be transformed. And we will truly become the body of Christ through our prayers. Amen? Amen. Please join us as we sing, It's Me, It's Me, O Lord, standing in need of prayer. <laughs>
gracious and loving God, we come before you and we open up our hearts to you. We lay ourselves before you honestly, unabashedly. We give ourselves to you. And we pray not our will, but thine. We pray that your will be done and that we work and listen so that what we do is following in your will and in your way. We desperately want to be your light shining in the darkness. We want to be your hands and your feet sharing love and bringing justice to this world around us. Help us to focus on the possibilities of doing that rather than the constraints holding us back. Help us as we seek to ask you for help, honestly and humbly. Help us as we seek to give thanks to you for all the many blessings, so many that we miss each and every day. And inspire us as we recognize those gifts and in response say, wow. Be especially present with those whom we've lifted up here this morning, with all of those who are hurting and in need, with those who feel lost, alone, and abandoned. Help us to find unique ways to reach out to all of them, to bring your light and your love into this community and into the world, even as we are separated For we know that no matter where we find ourselves, we are the church. And we ask that we follow in your way and in your will, that we can be the church through our prayers and through our actions. Help us to remember that this is our calling as we remember once again, but perhaps hearing it just a little bit anew this morning, the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have come now to our time of sharing our gifts, of just reminding us of how important our gifts are. Um, and I appreciate each and every one of you uh, who are still able to give to this church and to our ministries. But I also want to lift up all of those who are not able to do that. And I know that as time goes on, as the weeks continue, um, that that is more and more of you who are hurting and who are in a bind, who are looking for help from our government, from the state. Um, and and it's becoming more and more frustrating in that process um, as the state systems are overwhelmed, as the government's promises um, seem to be delayed or, or missing altogether, and, and it, the pain is real. And so I want, to, to know, want you to know that we are well aware of that and that we are lifting each and every one of you up in our prayers. If you are able to give, you can see the, the screen on your screen showing you how to do that. And we, of course, appreciate any gifts that you can give to us 
as we continue this ministry and now the ministry on Sunday evening. Wednesday evening, sorry, thank you. Um, I did want to just know, and it kind of goes hand in hand with that, is continued prayers for our preschool staff, um, children and families, in relation to all Absolutely. Pre definitely prayers for our preschool staff and, um, and the wonderful work that they are continuing to do as, one, as our most um, community-centered uh, ministry that we are doing right now, by far. And uh, so we appreciate the work that they are doing. So let us lift up these um, prayers as we uh, sing our doxology. me in our offering prayer. Whatever challenges we face, O oh God, we have also known your many blessings. Threshing floors full of grain, vats overflowing with oil. Accept these gifts as tokens of our thankfulness, that they may be used to answer prayers as we share your bounty with those in need. light shining on the path before us, with Jesus beside us as a guide and friend, and the Holy Spirit working within us, giving us strength and courage, hope and peace to go forward each and every day. Amen. special treat for our postlude today, the prayer as played and sung by 
uh, Tim and Deborah. Thank you. 